Right. Bonjour. Unfortunately, that's about where the French stops. <laughs> Un beer, s'il vous plaît? Probably not going to help me in this presentation. What I'm going to talk about this afternoon is what the future of the Java platform is going to be, as far as we know it at the moment. Now, one of the things that the acquisition of Sun by Oracle has led to was some uncertainty. Uh, what I want to do this afternoon is to try and help understand what the roadmap is, what the plans are for Java SE, the standard edition. Now, before Sun was acquired by Oracle, there was a, a lot of discussion about Java SE 7, the next version of Java, because Java SE 6 came out back in 2006. And that was a long time ago. That's sort of five years since we had the last major release of Java. And there were a few things which kind of got in the way of us actually releasing Java SE 7. There was the whole idea of open sourcing the JDK. So the Open JDK project took a lot more engineering effort, a lot more time than we originally thought. And so that delayed Java SE 7 a bit. There was also Java FX, the idea of rich internet applications, new ways of doing desktop applications, mobile applications, and so on, for Java, which again, took a lot more engineering effort and distracted us a bit from the ideas of Java SE, the platform. So once or Oracle took over, there was this whole idea of what, what's gonna happen next? And Oracle were very good about that in the sense that they, they sat down and they looked at what we've been planning and they came up with a clear direction for what was going to happen. And they said, okay, Java SE 7 will be this. And we're going to split what was originally Java SE 7 into Java SE 7 and Java SE 8. So the bits that were ready, almost ready, were going to go into Java SE 7. The things that still needed more work were going to go into Java SE 8. So that, that's kind of where we're coming from in terms of the, the planning. And I, I put nine on here as well because the, the plans are now going even further forward. And I was talking to one of our product managers, and he said that the, the current thinking is that they're actually planning all the way out to Java 12, which is going to be, well, I, I won't quote you hard dates for that because it's going to be a bit difficult, but the planning is looking forward to 2020 in terms of releases of Java. Now, the other thing that Oracle did in terms of clarifying the position around Java was that they wanted to make sure that people understood the priorities that we have in terms of the Java platform. So if we're going to change Java, why are we changing it? What's the advantages? What are the benefits? And so on. So we wanted to make sure that we continue to grow the number of developers who are using Java. Java, depending on which survey you look at, is the most popular programming language in the world. More people use Java in the majority of projects than any other language. And we want to build on that. We want to make sure that people coming out of universities are able to use Java. We want to make sure that people who are using Java at the moment get all the latest information and continue to want to use Java in projects. Because obviously there's a lot of work going on in other areas. You only have to look at the proliferation of other languages running on top of the JVM to see that people are looking at ways of doing things in different languages. You know, Scala has become very popular. Um, you know, Clojure, um, Jython, JRuby, all of these languages which sit on top of the JVM use the bytecodes, but not the syntax of Java. So from our point of view, we still want Java to be a very popular language. Yes, domain-specific languages on top of the JVM, we're very keen on that. The whole introduction of things like the invoke dynamic bytecode was all about helping people to make dynamically typed languages run more efficiently on top of the JVM. But ultimately, we want to try and drive Java adoption. And we want to make it more competitive in terms of its, not its price, we're not talking about marketing here. We're talking its competitiveness in terms of performance, in terms of how easy it is to use, all of those sorts of things. And realistically, we need to adapt to change. This is all down to the way that people write applications, the types of applications that people are developing. 
even the hardware platforms that people are using to deploy applications. We need to adapt to that change. So this is really the underlying philosophy, if you like, of how we're approaching the changes to Java. And from a, a point of view of the sort of themes that we have for Java, we're looking at really kind of continuing the ideas that we've had for, for several years. How do we make developers more productive? How can we make the code that you write simpler so it's easier to write the code, you can be more productive and write code more quickly, but also how can you make it clearer, easier to understand? Because clearly a lot of the time that you work on code is not necessarily creating new code, it's adapting other people's code, maintaining code, adding new features and so on. If we can make it easier to understand, easier to see what's going on, it's easier to do that maintenance and so you're more productive. Performance is always a big thing for us in terms of making sure that the Java virtual machine gives you the best possible performance for your applications. You know, we don't want you slowed down by things like garbage collection, um, synchronization and things like that. And we've done a lot of work to really address these issues, but there's always more we can do to make things even better. Universality is really about making sure that Java runs everywhere. The write once, run anywhere idea that we've had right from the very beginning. Modularity, and I'm gonna come back to this when we talk about some of the details of the things we're doing in Java SE 8, in terms of how can we make it easier to use Java as a platform in different ways? And that can mean both from an application development point of view, and also in terms of how we actually deploy the platform onto a specific device, a specific machine, a specific operating system or whatever. Integration, again, same kind of concept for integrating into platforms and so on, and serviceability. Once again, from a deployment perspective, serviceability is very, very important because if you've got big applications running on servers, you want to be able to get information about how well they're running, what are the performance bottlenecks, things like that. So all of these things need to be addressed in terms of the future of Java. When it comes to developing new features for Java, we need to be very careful about how we approach this because Java had some fundamental principles that were used when it was first created. And really it was about the idea of making the language readable. <clears throat> now I know from experience that it is quite possible to write very unreadable Java code. I'm sure if you've worked on other people's code, you'll know that it's very easy to see code that's hard to understand. Obviously, we all write very clear, concise code, but other people write code which is not necessarily easy to understand. And so we want to try and make it as easy as possible for people to write clear code. When it comes to adding new features, are we going to be hiding things from the developer, from the people who are maintaining the code, which makes it harder to understand? If you think about some other languages, um, who here has used you know, Perl as a programming language? A few people have used Perl. Right. Perl is a very powerful language. I've used this on a couple of projects. And I rapidly came to the conclusion that Perl is a write-only language. Once you've written it, it's impossible to understand what it is you've written. Um, now, I'm being unfair to Perl because, like I said, it's a very powerful language and you can do some very clever things with it in only a few characters. But if you've ever done any significant work with it, you'll know what I'm talking about. And we don't want that to be the case with Java. So we want to make sure that it's clear code, simple to understand, and so on. And when we make changes, you know, we've got to look at those kinds of, of things as the, the main reason for how the changes get made. Now, is it going to make it harder to see what's going on? Similarly, are we hiding things by using the compiler? We often use syntactic sugar in terms of some of the changes we make in order to make things simpler for developers. But sometimes they hide things in such a way that can lead to unexpected effects. Now, a good example of that is in Java SE 5. We introduced auto-boxing and unboxing. Java is not a fully object-oriented language because it has primitive values. If you want to include a primitive value into a collection, you need to encapsulate that in an object. 
So you use a wrapper class and you turn your int into an integer object and you add it to your collection. We added auto boxing and unboxing, which said, well, if you try and add a primitive value to a collection, the compiler will automatically instantiate a new integer object for you, passing that primitive value as the value to the constructor and do the work for you. Which sounds like a good idea. It means you have less typing, you don't have to do so much work. But if you've ever read Josh Block's book of Java Puzzlers, you'll see that there are some great examples there of how auto-boxing and unboxing can hide things from you, the developer, where you think you're doing one thing, because the compiler then says, oh, we'll change that into an object representation. Suddenly things are different, and you can get some very subtle bugs, which can be very hard to find with that sort of thing. So we want to try and avoid those sorts of problems when we change the language. Now again, when it comes to changing the language, what we're trying to do here is to make this a process which is as um, open as possible without being um, inhibiting to the process of making change. So if you, you think about the way that programming languages get developed, you've really got two sort of extremes. You've got the idea of one company controls everything and they simply decide what goes into the, the language and that's what you as developers get. You have no say in terms of new features. And then you've got the other extreme, which is the fully open, fully open source, uh, open standards, where everybody can have a say about what features go into that language. You can get situations where you have forks in the language. You can get situations where people can't agree on features. And it becomes very slow in terms of the development of those languages. What we've tried to do is to use the Java community process to pick a position which is half between the two. We need some level of control. We need some, somebody to sort of own the whole process and make sure that everything keeps moving along in a, a reasonable pace. And the Java community process is about doing that. So we have these JSRs, Java Specification Requests, which are expert groups that get together to decide on how a particular piece of functionality should be designed. So you get people who are interested in that particular piece of functionality, how it should be used and so on. They get together, they design it, and then they put it out for public review. People can make comments on it, that public review information can be taken back, they can make changes, and then we get a standard for the next version of whichever piece of Java technology we're dealing with. The Java community process has been through some, um, it's been through some changes. It's also been through some, some reasonably hard times in the last few years. There were some disagreements between various people within the Java community process and Sun, as it was at the time, and then Oracle. And what Oracle did when they took over was to say, okay, we need to make a decision. It may not be the most popular decision, but we need to make a decision and stick by that so that we can get the Java community process moving forward and have everything working again. So that's what they did. They decided on, on something. I won't go into the details of it because it's all just uh, very political, but it means that the Java community process is now moving again. We're now having a number of JSRs have been submitted and we're trying to improve on that process. So there are various things that are happening to improve the JCP. Uh, first of these is to allow us to add more people to the executive committee. The executive committees are the people who decide which JSRs should be approved, which JSRs are going to go forward and form an expert group. So we've, we've added some representation on these expert uh, executive committees. First of those is a group called SuJava. This is the, the biggest Java user group in the world. They have something like 10,000 members in Brazil. And there are a very vocal group when it comes to changes to Java. So there's Bruno Souza, who's the leader of that group. He's actually representing them on the executive committee, and he certainly um, is quite happy to give you his opinion on different things when it comes to how Java should be changed. Similarly, we want to make sure that big users of Java are represented. And so Goldman Sachs has been added as a representative of the financial community, who are very big users of Java. They have specific requirements that they need addressed, so it's useful to have their point of view when it comes to looking at what new features should be added and so on. <coughs> Similarly, London Java community is another big, 
very active Java user group that's in London. Uh, they have a representative now on there. And Alex Terrazas, who has done a lot of work on the mobile side of things, has been added to the, the Java Mobile Executive Committee. The other thing that we're doing is using the process itself to change the process. There is a, a JSR number 348, which is designed to address the actual Java community process and how JSRs go through all the different stages, all of the different things that are involved. What we want to do with that is to help make the process more transparent. Yes, we've had the idea of a public review that takes place once the specification has been completed and people can give their feedback and maybe changes can be made. But what we want to do is make it more transparent so that as the specifications are developed, you can actually see all of the email that's happening in terms of the expert group, the exchange of views on different features and so on. So this will be part of the thing that will be changing in the, the JCP, is to make things more transparent, make it easier for you to see what's going on in the different specifications and so on. We're also trying to tie down some of the timelines as well, because originally JSRs had a sort of a timeline that they were supposed to stick to, but some of them haven't managed to do that. There are some JSRs that are kind of lost in the wilderness and have taken years to get to uh, the next stage of the process. And what we want to do is tighten that up so that you know that once a JSR is started, there is a fixed timeline and these things will become a standard at a certain point in the future that you as developers can rely on. So if we just recap, recap very briefly on what was included in Java SE 7. As I said, this was what was referred to as Plan B when it came to launching Java SE 7. So we didn't want to delay Java SE 7 any longer, which we would have had to do if we were going to fulfill all of the ideas that were originally planned for Java SE 7. So what we ended up with was Java SE 7 as all the things that were almost ready, and then Java SE 8 was the things that were going to take longer, and things that we could add because we had more time. Java SE 7 included this thing called Project Coin. So that was some small changes to the language syntax. So we added things like the diamond operator, so that you didn't need to explicitly specify the generic type parameters twice in a definition. We added things like strings in switch statements. It only took us 15 years to get to strings in switch statements, but that was, you know, that was a big thing. So there were some small changes like that. The um, try with resources to make it easier to have your resources closed correctly um, without having to use nested try finally blocks and things like that. We also added some new features around the APIs. We always like to add more APIs to the, the class libraries. So there were some extensions around input and output. So we added uh, a lot better file system handling, a lot better support for some of the most common things that you would want to do in terms of file systems like copying a file and moving a file. I've got to say, personally, that's my favorite feature from Java SE 7. And it, it's just unbelievable it took us so long to get to the point where you could use a single method call to copy a file. But there you go. <coughs> Another big feature was the idea of the fork join framework. And this is where we're looking at how to make writing parallel code where you have things happening in parallel easier. In Java SE 5, we introduced the concurrency APIs so that you didn't have to do all of the, the very low level work with the sort of thread primitives, the sleep, wait, notify, interrupt type idea. And it gave you a much richer set of tools, things like semaphores, things like thread pools, and so on. Fork join framework was how we could approach the idea of fine-grained tasks which weren't interdependent. So there was no shared data between these different tasks. How you could take a group of these tasks, hand it to a framework so that it could break them up into smaller tasks, have those smaller tasks execute in parallel using whatever processes were available, and then having them synchronized so that when all the results were finished, the whole task was finished and you got the results. We'll kind of come back to that a little bit later. The um, 
Da Vinci Machine Project, this was the invoke dynamic idea to improve efficiency of dynamically typed languages running on top of the JVM. So we introduced a new bytecode into the instruction set for the JVM. Currently, that's not used in Java. In Java SE8, we will actually be using that. I'll, I'll mention that a little bit later on as well. So there's a whole group of things that went into that. Um, all of these are covered in JSR 336, which is the, the main JSR for the release contents of Java SE7. The other big thing that happened um, when Oracle took over Sun was clearly the need for convergence of the JVM. Oracle already had the JRocket JVM that they acquired when they bought BEA, and with the acquisition of Sun, they got the Hotspot JVM. And it just doesn't make sense to have two different developer teams writing two different JVMs, both of which are going to do effectively the same thing. So some work was done. The two teams got together. They had a, um, a discussion about which was the best JVM. Uh, nobody could make their mind up on that. The different JVMs are obviously aimed at different sort of um, positioning. What we found was that JRocket is more of an enterprise type of virtual machine. It's aimed at enterprise type applications. That's how it was designed. Hotspot is a more general purpose JVM. It was designed for working on desktops, even uh, smaller than desktops, and general purpose enterprise applications as well. And the decision that was made was that we would use Hotspot as the base for our new converged JVM. And then we take features from JRocket and add those to the Hotspot code base. And that seemed to be the easiest way, and there was a, a lot of agreement on the fact that that's what we should do. So that's what we're working on at the moment. It turns out it's not as much work as we thought, so we're making good progress on that in terms of integrating the features. Um, a lot of the features we're integrating are things around this serviceability idea. So there's um, two things. There's, there's mission control, which is a sort of uh, control system for managing a JVM. There's also flight recorder, which will gather lots of information about what's happening in a JVM so that you can do analysis after you've been running the JVM for some time. You can look at performance characteristics and so on. So moving into Java SE8, we need to look at what we're going to try and achieve. And one of the big things is understanding that the way that people write applications and how they're going to have to write applications is changing. And so there was a, there was a paper that was written um, a few years back, which was all about the free lunch is over. And by the free lunch, it was improvements in performance of hardware. Because we've tended to rely on Moore's law and the doubling of the number of transistors that you can fit into the same size space in terms of improving performance. And we've sort of tied that in the past to an increase in clock speed. So we increase the clock speed of the processor, processor runs faster, does more in the same space of time, you get better performance for your application. But around sort of 2003, 2004, we kind of hit some physical limits in terms of what we could do with clock speed. So clock speed has tended to sort of level off around the three gigahertz uh, range. We're sort of almost pushing four gigahertz now, but the rate at which we're going up is nowhere near as fast as it used to be um, back in the like 90s and early 2000s. So what's happening now is we're seeing a change in the way that the chip manufacturers are actually creating their um, processors. So rather than you getting one processor with the ability to execute a set of instructions in your CPU, what you now get is more than one core in the CPU. So this is the, uh, the old Sun line of processors, the uh, Spark line, which is now the Oracle line. And when we launched the T1 processor, or Niagara 1, what this did is it had four cores, all of which could handle eight simultaneous sets of instructions by doing pipelining and uh, instruction overlapping. So you could effectively get 32 instructions executed in parallel through this particular processor. And then we came up with the Niagara 2 or T2 in 2007 that had eight simultaneous um, threads that we could execute on eight cores, giving us 64 possible instructions that we could execute in parallel. 
And then along came the T3 process of this year, and we're talking about 16 overlapping instructions on eight cores, giving us 128 possibilities in terms of parallel instructions. So this is the kind of thing that we've got to address, is how do we write code that's going to make use of all these cores? But the other thing is it doesn't just apply to the server side of things. It also applies to clients. So you're finding now more and more devices, things like tablets, things like smartphones, that have multiple cores in them. So you can get dual core phones now, you can get tablets with um, you know, two cores in them. NVIDIA has um, been demonstrating the Tegra 4, which has four cores in it. So we're really getting into multi-processing parallel code on pretty much everything we're doing. So what this leads us to is understanding what we're going to do in Java SE 8. So I have put a big disclaimer here, which is that the syntax that I'm going to show you right now is not guaranteed to be the syntax that we will have when we actually release Java SE 8. It is looking better. We, we went through some recent changes, literally it was only about a, a month ago, that some significant changes happened in terms of the syntax. So it's looking likely that this is fairly good in terms of the syntax that we'll be using. But like I say, just be aware that this is not finalized yet. So there may yet be some changes. So let's look at a piece of code. Now, the syntax of this, I'm pretty sure won't change because it doesn't use any new features. So what I've got here is the idea of a class which contains some information standard kind of thing that we're approaching. So we've got a student which has a name, they have a graduation year, and they have a score in terms of the score that they had in their exams. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put a number of these records in a collection. So again, this is a very standard sort of thing that we have to approach in all sorts of different types of applications. What we quite often want to do is to look at that collection of objects and do some sort of processing on it. So what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, let's take our collection of students and let's look for the person who had the highest score in a particular year. Well, the way we can do that is we can write a simple loop. We can say four and then we can iterate over the collection of our students and then for each element that we have in that collection, we can say, if the graduation year is 2011, we look at the score of that student and we say, is it greater than the maximum we already have? So again, very simple bit of code, but it, it represents a very common task or type of task that we do in applications. So the problem here is if we have a number of students which is very large, you know, we could have 100,000 students covering you know, many different universities and so on and we need to search all of those records. This is inherently serial, so there's no way that we can take this code and easily say, right, let's make it parallel in order to look at groups of students and then get the results. Now, what we could do is we could take this code and we could rewrite it using the fork join framework. That's exactly what the fork join framework was designed for. The drawback to that is that if you do it, the code is not gonna fit on one slide um, for, the app, for the presentation. In fact, it's going to fit on about four or five slides. So you end up with quite a lot of code to do something which looks to be a fairly simple task in terms of making it parallel. So we need to have a different approach to how we're going to do that. So what we really need to do is to focus on the fact that there are certain things that we're interested in here. So clearly, we're interested in our collection of students. That's the data that we're working with. We then want to do something which takes that data and reduces it based on some criteria. So the criteria being that we're only interested in students who graduated in the year 2011. And then we want to perform some operation on that in terms of analyzing the data and saying, give me the maximum of the scores of those students. Okay, so we could do that in terms of applying a different approach. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take our collection and we're going to say, let's filter that collection by using an anonymous inner class. So an anonymous inner class allows us to 
effectively pro provide some functionality that we can change. So we're saying here that we're going to filter the collection based on a new predicate interface or object that inter uh, <coughs> sorry object which implements the predicate interface. So all the, these are all new type things. So in that, we're going to have some sort of operation which will do something in terms of returning a Boolean based on whether the <coughs> excuse me based on whether the, the graduation year is 2011. So then we need to map that data. And again, we're going to use an object which implements the extractor interface, create an anonymous in a class, and extract from that the score. So it's simply going to return the field that we need. And then we're going to reduce the data based on some kind of um, reducer which uses the score and looks for the maximum value that we have in the set of data that we've got. So this is a, a clearly a, a different way of, way of approaching the problem and a more flexible way of approaching the problem. But the problem we end up with there is that it becomes very verbose. So we end up with all this complex inner classes and having to implement them all and doing things like that. So the inner class is an imperfect closure. It has bulky syntax because you've got all these extra lines where you've got to create a new instance of it, you've got to have a, the method implemented and so on. But it also has a number of other drawbacks because the way that inner classes are implemented means that you, you can't use non-local, sorry, non-final local variables. So if you try and reference something outside of the, the inner class, it has to be final in order for you to be able to do that. There's some complexities in terms of what is the meaning of things like return, what do we mean when we break, when we continue, okay, if it's just within a loop, that's fine, but if we're using labels, where does that go to? And also non-local control flow operators. You know, all of these things are complicated when it comes to using inner classes. So what we're proposing for Java SE 8, and we've been proposing for Java SE 7 for quite a long time, is the idea of closure-like constructs. And I, I need to be quite kind of a little bit specific here, which is it's not really closures. Closures are a more complex thing. We're re really proposing uh, a subset of closures, which we're calling lambda statements. So what we get is the idea of changing from using an anonymous in a class into using a lambda statement. So here, we're going to use the, the arrow. This is where the, the syntax has changed just recently. There was a lot of discussion about whether we should use an equals followed by a um, greater than or whether we should use a minus followed by a greater than. And so the discussion went back and forth about whether it was confusing because if you end up with a, an expression where you've got less than equals to and you're using a, a lambda expression, it can get quite confusing in terms of the code. So at the moment, we're using a minus followed by a greater than to indicate a lambda expression. So here what we're saying is we're going to filter the student to being student grad year equals 2011. So it's the same thing that we had in our anonymous in a class. We're basically providing a predicate which says if the graduation year is 2011, we select that set of results from our collection. We're then going to map the bits of data that we're interested, from, in, interested in from the collection to the things that we're going to use. So again, we say we map, and in this case, we're saying that the student S is going to be the score S, the score of S. And then finally, we're going to reduce that using the math operator max, method max, and we're going to pass in the current maximum and the, the score that we have for each student in order to get the result. So we can immediately see that's a simpler piece of code. But we can actually go further <coughs> we can go further than that because the compiler can do a reasonable amount of inference for us. So we can immediately say, okay, well we know that we're working on a collection of students, student objects, so there's no need to actually specify the there's no need to specify the type 
the compiler can infer it. So we end up with S goes to the grad year being 2011, S the score, and then we can also use a method reference, which is another slight change to the syntax. So we can simply say math max, and that will give us the maximum value of uh, all of the results that we have. So we now end up with some nice, concise syntax for specifying the way that we want to do this um, analysis of our code. And by doing this way, if we want to change the way that it happens, we can simply change the lambda statement. So rather than looking for the maximum, we could look for the minimum. Rather than looking for the graduation year, we could look for a particular school. Those types of things we can make <coughs> very easy in terms of the way that we approach the, the changes to the functionality. But of course, this doesn't solve the fundamental problem that we started with, which is how to make it parallel. We still got the same structure in terms of saying, OK, we're taking our various bits, we're looking for the graduation year, getting the score, finding the maximum. Well, it turns out it's very easy, because what we can do is we can introduce a new method on that, which says, OK, make this parallel. So we don't care now about how this actually happens. All we're saying is that there is this set of results that we're interested in. This is the functionality. <coughs> this is the functionality that we want in terms of how we do the map, how we do the reduction, and so on. How it gets made parallel, the system underneath can worry about that. We can say, okay, you can divide that up into however many processes we've got, how many cores we've got, and so on and do the parallelization of that code. Synchronize it so that all the results are ready, and suddenly we've got a simplified way of providing the parallel approach to our, our system. Now, the thing is that in Java, we use a lot of these types of, of classes. We have single abstract method classes. They're all over the place. So there's things like runnable, there's things like callable, event handler, comparator, and all sorts of things like that. This is the area that we need to really address with Lambda statements. So we've seen some examples of that, but it's really about saying, rather than using an anonymous in a class and implementing that class in order to provide that particular piece of functionality, so if we're dealing with a button in a user interface, you know, the event handler has to be an anonymous in a class, or we have to implement it in some other class, or whatever. Let's do the same thing using a Lambda statement. And as I've said, the problem with this is the amount of noise to work ratio that you get with these things. So you end up with anonymous in a class, which is really like five to one. So you've got five lines of code, but there's actually only one line of code there that you're really interested in, which is the you know, print line C.V. So we end up with the idea of a Lambda statement where you specify the thing that you're interested in and then you say, what I want to do is, here's the parameter that I'm passing to it, here's what I actually want to happen in terms of the structure of that. So it's, it's effectively the same as the method call. So you're passing in the parameters and then we're executing a set of statements. So you could have multiple statements in there. You can have brackets, you can have semicolon separated statements, and you can have more complex things happening. You're not limited to just you know, a single uh, operation within that. The, uh, the other thing is that there are some, you know, a variety of things that you can do in terms of examples. So we've got the idea of saying, okay, the context C is going to be the thing that we're passing as a parameter. System.out.println C.V is what we actually want to happen. And then, as I already said, we can infer the type in situations where it's obvious to the compiler. So in certain situations, we don't need to specify the type. You can if you want, but you don't have to. So the compiler will say, okay, we know that in this case we're dealing with a context, so C will be a context and we don't need to specify the type. Similarly, we can have simple arithmetic operations. So you can say int x, and the the, that's the parameter that's being passed. The result is x plus 1. Um, Mm, yeah, and we can make that a little bit more um, specific so you can have things like in the case of a runnable you can say it doesn't take any parameters so we have empty brackets um, and that will the method body if you like will be to print out this thing is running so we can create a runnable of that type 
Now, this is again where some of the discussion is going on as to do we, how do we deal with the situation where you don't have any parameters? So could you actually do away with the brackets completely and have just a, an arrow which points to the system.out.print line? And there, there's some discussion going on about that because um, in certain situations it might be difficult for the compiler to actually work out what's going on. And there are other situations where it might be difficult for you as a developer to see clearly what is being meant by that particular statement. So that's one of those things that's not quite final yet. Similarly, you know, you can um, pass this as, in effect, an object reference. So this is what a, a Lambda statement allows you to do, is to pass what is effectively a method as an object reference. So you can pass it as a parameter to a method and you can deal with it in that way. Now, there are some things you can't do. So, for example, the thing that you create has to be a sim single abstract method type of instance. So you can't make the thing that you're creating more complex because this is effectively a method that you're creating. So in the case of saying, okay, object O equals no parameters, the return is 42, that's not a valid sequence because it's not a single abstract method implementation. There's also some other rules that we have in terms of how these things work. So you need to have a list of statements because it is just like a method. Think of it as being a method um, in the body. You can't have things like a break. You can't have a continue at the top level, so you can't come out of it. Um, return type is inferred by the compiler and looks at the possibilities of the return from the body that you're specifying and then it will use that to infer what the return type is. You can actually um, cast it if you want to make it more specific. You can reference the um, enclosing object by using the this. So this will refer to the this outside the Lambda statement. So it doesn't refer to things inside the Lambda statement refers to things that are in the object that contains that lambda statement. And you can use effectively final variables. So this is a little bit different from the anonymous inner classes. In anonymous inner classes, if you wanted to reference something outside of the anonymous inner class, you had to explicitly make it final by saying that the variable you accessed was final. Okay. In lambda statements, what we're saying is that if adding final to the variable name would not change things, then you can reference it. So you don't have to make it explicitly final, but the variable that you're accessing has to be effectively final. So that, like I say, if you added final to it, it wouldn't change anything in, w in the way that the code works. But you don't actually have to add the final qualifier to the, the declaration of your variable. So we end up with a situation where we've got our lambda statements and we've got this wonderful piece of code now. So we're saying, okay, let's filter on this, map this, and reduce this. There's one really big problem with this, which is that we're using a collection of students. Okay, great. Collection doesn't have a filter method. Collection doesn't have a map method. Collection doesn't have a reduce method. So we're a bit stuck here because what we would have to do is we'd have to add all these methods to the interface collection. Okay, we could do that. That would be really bad in terms of backwards compatibility because suddenly if people have already got collections that they've implemented which don't have filter, map, or reduce in them and we suddenly extend the, the collection interface to include those things, if people use them, then suddenly there's going to be a problem because the binary compatibility with other classes is just not going to work. It's all going to break in, in a horrible mess. So we're faced with the situation of how do we deal with this problem? And the answer is to have, obviously, the collections class that we have at the moment, and then we need to add some methods to it. So what we're going to do is we're going to have an extension method. So here what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, in our collections class, um, yep, in our set, whatever, we're going to have an extension method called reduce. And it's going to have a default implementation which will come from the collections utility class. So this gives us the ability to add 
a method to an interface without breaking backwards compatibility. Because what will happen is, if you've already got your class, which is using a collection which doesn't have the reduced method in it, what will happen is if somebody calls the reduced method on your collection, it will go to the collections class and use the default method in there. Now, don't know what that would do, but it will have some functionality built into it. So it gives us the ability to extend interfaces, add methods to them, without breaking backwards compatibility. So by defining, by defining a default um, method that can be used from somewhere else, we're allowing us to extend an interface. So we end up with the idea that in our collection we'll have uh, a filter method, we'll have a map method, we'll have a reduce method, and so on. We can expand those further. Um, other things that we're considering <coughs> for uh, language changes, obviously a lot of the things we do in Java, um, we use classes, we use objects, and some of those classes are immutable. So things like string are immutable. This is another example, you know, we have a node which is part of a, a graph and that's immutable. Once we set the values in it, we can't change them. So what we'd like to be able to do is to make the compiler and the virtual machine more efficient by not having to continually create instances of these things on the heap. We might want to put them somewhere else to make it more efficient. But clearly we can't do that if we can't determine straight away that these things are immutable. So what we'll do is we'll say, okay, let's mark this as being a value object. And that way the compiler will know this is immutable as an object. Now again, this is not syntax which is definite yet. This is still in the sort of proposal stages. There's still things we're talking about. So don't go saying, oh, what? This is what's definitely going to be there. And similarly, we could use the beam pattern to say rather than having our definition of the various um, parameters of our, ver of our class and having access of methods to those, we can simply say this is a value class node and it has properties of parent, left child and right child. And the bean pattern says, okay, you will have an accessor method by default that's created for that. So even though you haven't defined a get parent method, the get parent method will be there so you can call it because it's part of the bean pattern and it's part of a, a property. Again, this is still stuff that's being investigated. We're not 100% sure this will actually go in yet, but it's, it's something we're considering. Um, collection literals. This is somewhat like the idea of auto-boxing and unboxing. So what we want to do is to say, if you're going to create a collection and you're going to put primitive types into it, wouldn't it be nice if we can make it simpler for you rather than having to do it in a more complex way. So what we'll do now is we'll simply say, okay, in the case of uh, a list of integers, we can simply specify an array of integers and the compiler will understand that these need to be auto-boxed into that collection. Um, primes, again, similar sort of idea. I've got to say that this is one of those things I'm not 100% certain about because it's the sort of situation where maybe auto-boxing and unboxing you know, hides things from the user. Is this going to be entirely clear? Is it going to hide things from the developer when we're actually, <coughs> when we're actually doing things? Um, and then we could obviously have our set of honest politicians, which is uh, very relevant at the moment, which would be an empty set. Um, similarly, collection literals, you know, same, same sort of idea. You know, when we're putting things, we could have the idea of uh, we can have how we do it at the moment where we call a put method and we pass the parameters to that. Why don't we just say, okay, let's do an, a, a simplified syntax where we're saying the method or the objects that we want to add and we simply say they have these values, uh, four and tetrahedron, six and cube and so on. And we'll use a colon to indicate that these are different fields within the um, the thing that we're adding to the collection, so in this case a map. So all under discussion at the moment. Now the other big thing at the moment is modularization. So just talk a little bit about this. This is how we would typically call an application in Java. So we call Java and then we specify the main class 
which contains the main entry point. Problem is that what this tends to look like is something like this, or a lot more complicated, because you have a class path and you have a bunch of jar files, all of which need to be specified on that class path. Now, we have done some things in terms of making that easier by adding the wildcard, great innovation on our part, to allow you to specify a wildcard in the class path and say, OK, all of the jar files in this, particular in this particular directory are to be used. But it still doesn't solve the problem, because at the moment with jar files, we've got no way of specifying versions. We can do it with the name of the jar file, but there's no way of specifying the interdependencies between the jar files, which versions are required, and so on. So what we're going to do is, well, actually, yeah. So the, the information we're actually interested in is the, the things highlighted in red. Obviously, we're interested in Java. We're interested in the names of the jar files. And we're interested in where the main entry point is. And the solution to that is to have a module info.java file, which will be part of your um, packaged application so that when the virtual machine runs this, it knows the details about what is required. So it knows the name of the module as being the aggregator module, which version number it is, version 1. And then it knows which JAR files are required. So you've got JDOM, TagSuit, and so on. And then it knows which is the main entry point. That way, when you want to start the application, you simply say, here's my module path, which is where you go to find those JAR files. It knows which JAR files are required, so it knows how to resolve those. It knows where the main entry point is and off it goes. So it makes the whole starting of your application significantly simpler. And we can take this further because we can build up the dependencies between these. So we can say, OK, these are the dependencies directly, but also there will be other dependencies from one jar file to another. So JDOM, for example, or JDOM, for example may depend on Jackson and Sachs path. And so that leads us to the idea of having you know, the dependencies automatically figured out. So here what we're trying to do is get rid of class path completely, which would be really nice to just do away with class path entirely. Um, the other thing that we can do with this is to, to make this a little bit more clever. So at the moment we have jar files. We're talking about having a thing called a jmod, which is a jmodule file, as a replacement to a jar file. But it would be nice if we could generate something else in terms of packaging our application. So why not have an RPM file or a Debian file or, or some form of um, file which is designed to run on a particular platform? And even, let's take it from the Maven stage. Here's the stuff we're going to use as our input. Let's automatically take all of that, generate the output, and have it done with some simple tools. So the idea is, like I said, to uh, eliminate the class path, but also to make it work with smaller devices. So we're not talking about just modularizing applications. We're also talking about modularizing the JDK itself. So you have like a, a headless set of APIs which represents the, the core of Java. You've then got things like AWT. You've got things like Swing. You could have a Corba module for anybody who's still using Corba. Um, you could have different modules that sit on top of this. So you only need the modules that are required for your application to get it started. That way, when it comes to downloading a new version of the JVM, rather than having to download all of these class files, even in compressed form, you simply download the ones you need to get your application started. And then you can lazily download the other parts of the JVM, and the JRE, as you have time and bandwidth available. So it simplifies the whole startup process and makes it faster. So we're going to have the, um, uh, the idea of the sort of modules for the Java SE platform. So there'll be a base profile, and then there'll be a base module, and then we'll have component modules on top of that. So the proposed content for JDK 8 is basically Project Jigsaw. This is the modularization side of things. Project Lambda, which is the closures, uh, Lambda statements that we talked about. The convergence of the JVM should be finished by timeline for Java SE 8. We're going to upgrade Java FX. Um, and there's some discussion about including Java FX as part of the, the core libraries. Again, don't quote me as saying that's definite. It's just an idea at the moment. 
um, as a way of extending beyond Swing, and making user interfaces easier to develop. Better support for JavaScript. So there's a project going on, Nashorn, which is providing a much uh, higher performance JavaScript engine so we can integrate Java and JavaScript, and those types of things. Um, better device support for desktops so that you can finally use things like cameras and uh, compass and accelerometer and things like that. Some language changes, already talked a little bit about some of those. Annotations on types to extend the way that we use annotations um, in the, the language at the moment. And then various updates to the APIs. One of the most popular apparently is the date and time update, JSR 310, <coughs> internationalization, accessibility, and so on. Looking into the future even further, Java SE 9, um, there's not anything really sort of concrete that I can say, okay, it's going to be multiple inheritance or it's going to be, um, you know, this or that. We're looking at all sorts of different things more as themes at the moment in terms of what do we need to do to the language to get it to support these things. So interoperability, again, extending things so that the JVM becomes a better platform for other languages um, that are compiled into bytecodes. Support for cloud computing in terms of the requirements of multi-tenancy, resource management, and so on. A self-tuning JVM, rather than having to do all of the complex command line options and things like that. Um, unified type system, maybe, data structure optimizations. A lot of work in using the features of Java SE8, putting them into the class libraries and things like that. Um, and, and really just sort of going as far as we can with the different features. Um, JNI was a big one that we're looking at, is to make that easier. So if you do want to get into native code and actually access it, rewriting JNI to make it a whole lot easier. Um, just to conclude then, um, the Java platform is going to continue to evolve. It's not a language that is just going to stop. It is, uh, as some people in some analyst reports said, Java is the new COBOL. Java is most definitely not the new COBOL. It will continue to change. It will continue to adapt to the needs of developers. Java SE8 will add some nice big features, things like Lambda statements and modularity, and expect to see more in Java SE9. And then lastly, um, places to go for more information. The OpenJDK project is where we're developing everything. So you can actually go and download Java SE8 now if you want to. There is a very early build. Don't expect to see all of the features in there. Um, but you can actually download a very early build of Java SE8 from the OpenJDK project. And then I have to put this slide up because this is, what, this is one of the differences between working at Oracle and working at Sun, is I have to have a legal statement in my presentation, which basically says, don't believe anything I just told you. Um, well, no, it doesn't, no. It, it don't base any purchasing decisions on what I've just told you, but since we give Java away for free, um, it's, it's not too relevant. So that's really it. That's hopefully given you an idea of what we're doing in terms of the future of Java SE, the platform. So thank you very much. Two or three questions, if anybody's got them. If I can see anybody. So, so the question is about support for Mac OS. Mac OS. Um, it, it, was, it was unclear a while ago what was happening because um, Apple made the announcement that they were um, discontinuing support for Java on Mac OS, which upset a lot of people. So then they kind of backtracked a little bit and they said that they would contribute code to the OpenJDK project in order to have a Mac build available. What we as Oracle are doing is we've said we, will, we use the OpenJDK as our source base. So all of the development is done in the OpenJDK project. What we then do is we take that code and we create binary distributions from that code. So we provide a Windows version, we provide a Linux version, we provide a Spark version, uh, sorry, Solaris version. Um, what we're now doing is we will be providing a Mac version of the binary distribution based on the OpenJDK source code. 
We haven't done it quite yet. It's, it's simply because of the engineering effort that's required to integrate the code. There is an early release available, um, so you can, you can actually get that um, from our website. It's available. Um, I'm running it on my Mac. Seems to work fine. Um, it's great to have Java 7 uh, running on my Mac, and we will be keeping that up to date. So you'll get the Mac release at the same time as the Windows release, at the same time as the Linux release, same time as the Solaris release. Yeah. Right, so OpenJDK is going to be the source code base, the source reference for the JDK. So that's the source, and then Oracle will produce binary versions of that. So there's a subtle difference there. The source code will be OpenJDK. The binary distributions that we create will come from that source code. The other binary distributions like um, HPUX, AIX, they will also use the, and Red Hat as well, um, they will also use that source code base, but then they will create their own binary distribution from that. I honestly don't know. Um, I didn't realize that there wasn't type inference in it in the classes. Um, oh, an anonymous class. Um, yeah, I don't know the details of that. I mean, I could certainly ask the engineers if they're working on anything like that, but I, I've got to say I don't know what, the, what we're doing in that respect. I know that there are complexities in terms of um, using the diamond operator because it isn't simply a case of taking the, the left-hand string and replacing it between the right hand angle brackets. It does actually have to be type inference rather than, than just a cut and paste. Um, but I, I don't know if we're doing anything to extend that further. Sorry. Yeah, I think I've run out of time. Thank you very much. Okay.